What's up, guys? A lot has happened in the past week, but before we get to that, I just wanted to take a moment and reflect on what happened since 2007-2008, where I did lose a lot of my confidence in the U.S. banking system, watching all the too-big-to-fail bailout programs that the government provided to prop up these big banks, which now, almost 20 years later, we're, I think, going to be heading into similar turbulent times. And it's always good to kind of reflect and remember what happened back then if you think something similar is going to happen soon. And so the first thing I wanted to show you was this cast of characters. And these people were all promoting and saying that, you know, 2009 was going to be a great year. Or rather, 2008 was going to be a great year. And well, it, it wasn't, right? And this was kind of like what they were saying at the end of 2007. Um, and my favorite is this man over here, who still today has always been trotted out to the major MSM, mainstream media, financial TV shows like CNBC and so forth. And he's always prognosticating. I mean, the last thing he said that what blew up in his face was he said that small caps were going to explode. And they kind of did and then totally collapsed. Uh, so that was, that was not a right call. But here we are. And he's still again saying that th things are going to be great and rosy. And, you know, this, this is when these people, it was the end of 07, right, going into 08 over here where they said things were going to be great in 08, and obviously things were not great in 08. Now, the point here is not to say these guys are idiots and, you know, the bulls are always wrong. And, you know, there is a similar cast of characters on the bear side, like you can say Jeremy Grantham and Peter Schiff and all these other folks who are always saying that we're going to, go doom, right? Like the gloom, doom, and boom report, Mark Faber guy. And so my point here is that's not it, right? They just have a general disposition. And it turns out there tends to be more frequent like upside than there are downside in the general trajectory of equities, which is to go up. And so that's why it seems like, hey, you know, these like doomsayers are never right. No, they're right. They're just less often right because the doom doesn't happen as often, right? And so the ones who are always saying things are going to go up seem to be more right, just because things tend to go up more frequently than things tend to go down. But that doesn't mean that things are going to go down. So my approach is not to be on one side or the other. It's actually to try and understand when we're going to have these pivots. I'm talking about large pivots in the market. And we haven't had one in 20 years. I mean, the last two we had was in 2000 and the dot-com crash. And then in 2007 and 2008, when we had the financial crisis. And so that's how infrequent these things had. And since then, we haven't had one, right? So we are long due for one. And we haven't had one because there's been an excessive amount of government printing. It's basically like you, you got to go to the bathroom, right? Every so often, a good cycle is good to clear out all the bad stuff in the economy. Well, we haven't been going to the bathroom because the government's been printing like crazy, right? Every time we think you're going to go to the bathroom, we take a, a pill and then, you know, but make no mistake, there's stuff in our gut that needs to go out, poo-poo, and it's coming. So this chart is an interesting chart because it, it shows you actually what happened after the last two times in the past couple of decades when the Fed started increasing rates and then like pivoted and then started decreasing rates, right? Back in 2000 in the dot-com crash and then also back in 07, 08 during the financial crisis. And basically when they started to lower interest rates, this is when bad things started to happen. So the narrative of, hey, you know, if the Fed lowers rates, the stock market is just gonna go up and up and up because interest rates are low, isn't, isn't true, right? It hasn't been true in the past couple of decades. And it doesn't mean that it can't be true, but generally speaking from what I see in recent history, in the more modern markets, hasn't been the case, right? And so that brings the question, what is going to happen this time around? Now, before I continue, I do want to just uh, mention about who I am and what my background is, because I think in today's uh, world, you really need to know who you're listening information from, because there's a lot of like hocus pocus uh, out there and, and lots of information spewed. So the challenge is to understand the fidelity from the noise or get the signal from the noise, as they say, the signal to noise ratio. So, you know, my background actually has been in investments, right? Like I spent decades at some of the top investment companies, whether it be hedge funds at Bridgewater under Ray Dalio or large institutional asset managers, such as Wellington Management. Um, and what I did for these large 
uh, investment entities was I, I built technology systems, right? Mm -hmm. Trading systems, risk management systems, liquidity systems, allocation systems, and so on and so forth. And later in my career, I even worked for sovereign wealth funds, right? So these are big, big entities with you know hundreds and hundreds of billions and if not trillions of dollars. Um, and the way they work was very different in terms of managing uh, or allocating assets, as you want to call it. So that's my background, right? I, I have, and you can look at it on my LinkedIn profile down below where, you know, I have over 40,000 followers and you can see and legit, try and legit check if what I'm saying is real or not. But the bottom line is, I'm not saying that because of that, I'm like some guru. No, but what you should know is that is the background from which I came from. And so I bring that kind of lens or viewpoints, if you will, to the equation when I'm talking about this stuff. And so that's an important thing I think you, know, you should know about me before you continue to listen to what I'm about to say. Now back in 07 and 08, everybody thought housing price was going to just keep going up. And the common uh, phrase was, well, house prices never ever go down. And that was actually kind of true. House prices never really went down in the United States. It kept appreciating. And I can tell you back then I was a lot younger and I had immense pressure. I had just gotten married to my ex-wife and I had immense pressure on buying a house because that was the right thing to do. And you know, if you get married, the first thing, next thing you got to do is buy a house. And if you don't buy a house, you're, you're a failure. And you know, I practicing Fofty's principles, which is the whole point of this, right? I, I decided not to follow what everybody was pressuring me to do. And I didn't buy a place. And we were living in Manhattan in New York City back then. And, you know, even a, a one bedroom place or two tiny two bedroom, but a one bedroom place was like million dollars right back then, which was kind of expensive for a one bedroom tiny place. And I, I did not want to do it. And I, and I held on and, and did not buy it. And guess what happened, right? Like the home prices went down, right? And this is the, the average across the entire nation. But, you know, there were places where it went down up to 50%, including places like, um, uh, you know, high value places like New York. Well, it didn't go down 50%, but there was a significant drawdown in the housing prices back then. And yeah, I avoided all that, right? Instead, I took my capital and what did I do? I, I bought a lot of gold back then. And that actually um, increased my net worth by quite a bit. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I emerged from the 0708 crisis uh, actually in a, in a much better position, right? I, I actually, my net worth increased by almost twice, 100% increase, where I know a lot of people who were around me lost uh, a lot, right? Some even everything and had to kind of start from scratch. And so that's what I feel is happening today. And that's why I'm spending this time. This time I'm actually trying to share it with people because... You know, last time I just kind of kept it to myself, but this time I'm trying to share it with people. So let's go through a couple of things I've put together so you understand where I'm coming from here. Now, back in 07 and 08, after raising interest rates for a while, Fed finally decided to cut, right, on September 18, the same date that they did this year in 2024, but it was 2007. So September 18, 2007, they cut also by 0 0.50, 50 basis, but pretty big cut, right? After having raised it for a while. And after that, there was a little blip in the market. Whoa, you know, we're to the moon. And so there's this little blip. And then what happened was the Fed minutes were released on October 9. And that's where things began to unravel. Now, if you saw the last episode where I was talking about Last week, I said the week that just passed is a very pivotal week. It's going to give a signal as to what is going to happen with the markets longer term. It wasn't a message about whether the market was going to go up or market was going to go down. It was a message that whatever the market's going to do during that week is going to be a very important signal as to what's to come. So what's going to happen this time around? Are we going to see another peak around here? Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, as I talk about what I think is going to happen in the next week and how am I positioned. But let's move on to the bigger picture as to why I think and why I feel uncomfortable and why I do think that something not good is going to happen to us, just like in 07 and 08. And now this is the monthly chart of the S&P, or actually it's the, the futures, the ES or the futures market for the S&P. But basically, what you see here is, and this, these are years, right? So this is a very long term. This is 10 years right here, right? So each little blip is like a long time. What we see here is just a relentless rise, right? That 
had some corrections. This was a COVID correction. And then this was a correction a couple of years ago. And now we are here at the all time high. And every time we've made these all time highs, we have made lower highs on what is the RSI or the relative uh, strength index. Now, if you know anything about you know, market dynamics, what you have here is what you call a divergence, where on the one hand, one measure is going down, so lower highs. And on the other hand, the measure is going up, which is higher highs in the price action. So we have a clear divergence going on here. And actually, right now, we're at the trend line of the RSI monthly divergence. So will it go above here? It could, right? But this trend line here is something I'm watching very carefully because chances are it will not go up there. And the reason is if you look down here, this is the MACD, another uh, instrument a lot of people use, you will see that we're actually very near the top. And again, this would be a divergence if it's horizontal, whereas the last two times it has been going up by quite a bit. The last thing I want to show you over here is this, this red line, which I'm going to just share with you since you're, <laughs> you're some of my uh, happy subscribers. This is something I developed uh, myself, right? So it's a proprietary indicator based on algorithm and formula that incorporates volatility, incorporates the volatility of volatility, so derivative of the volatility, incorporates some dark pool activity. And if you don't know what dark pool is, I mean, you can just Google it, but it incorporates some of that action along with options chains with zero DTE, another thing you can look up, but zero DTE option chain action into this uh, algorithm. And I wanna share with you what this thing, this, this, this is a monthly, so again, this is not a daily or even weekly thing, but a monthly uh, indicator that I use to detect shifts, right? On what's going on. Now, what I wanna show you is, I, whenever it goes above this yellow threshold that I have here, right, it tends to indicate ahead of time. So this is a predictor, not a laggard, but a predictor of what may happen. And what may happen is a direction shift. Doesn't mean it's gonna go up or gonna go down, but it means that there is a potential shift in whatever direction it was going that the opposite's gonna happen. And I've highlighted here in these violet um, purple lines, the few times when it has happened in the past 10 years, when it has gone above my yellow break-even line. And so the last time it happened here, after a few months, we've had this period of stagnation. And again, one of the things to be careful about is the, the, the amount of which it goes above the yellow line has no uh, it, you know, bearing on how severe the turn will be, right? The, it just saying that there is a probable turn that is imminent. And so here we had Another one of these indicators go up right at the top of the RSI. And yes, we did have for a few months some pretty, pretty steep corrections. Then up here was the Cervasa sickness or the COVID virus. And again, it peaked above. And we did have that record crash actually, right? It was only, you know, it was like 30% in like a couple of months, which was crazy, right? Back here, we had the indicator go off and it signaled that this was gonna happen here. The signal went off again, and guess what? We had, a, we had a trend change shift, and it went up here. Signal got triggered again, right, earlier this year. And we did have a down month, but it, it, so that was a pretty significant correction that we experienced earlier this year, but it continued to go up. And so that brings us up to where we are now, right? And now we are at this pretty high level. Again, cleared the yellow line at this level, along with the divergence of the RSI and the divergence, negative divergence forming in the MACD. So this is why I'm very careful about what's going on in the markets. It seems like to me, it's foretelling of a pretty big significant change on the way, right? If we zoom in a little bit, um, could this happen? I don't know, right? What I do know is parabolic moves tend to have a symmetrical uh, left and right side to it, and this is a parabolic move up. And so if that plays out, you could expect, I mean, I do expect this to revisit the low created during the COVID crash, but probably not in a straight line. You gotta remember, again, this is a monthly time frame, so this line will mean a lot of like this going, you know, but this is a general trend. 
going down. I'm not saying this is 100% guaranteed, but this is what I'm looking at given what I've shown you, particularly based on my proprietary indicator over here. If we zoom in now, and I converted this to lines, so it's easier to see than bars, we are now at the weekly time frame. So zooming in from monthly to weekly. And we see again that we are at the all time highs. Applying the same analysis, again, when did we go above, but just kind of see it more in granularity. Again, whenever we went above here, we had this weekly correction. It was correcting down and it got triggered. Well, that was the bottom and it went up. It got triggered over here. It's after it started going down. Well, it changed and went back up. But then it got triggered again. So that was saying, look, now I'm going to go back down. And it did. They got triggered again around here. Again, earlier than when the bottom was formed. But it predicted that a bottom would be formed. And it did form, right? And here it predicted after going up that we go down. And we did go down, but it didn't go down further. We did go down, though. And now it has shot up again. And here we are, right? Now, in last week's video, I talked about how we were tracking the price action of the top in 07 and 08, how we went up, down, up, down, and now at the all time highs. You got to remember a topping process with such a long bull run doesn't end overnight, especially the longer the bull run is. And this is a historically long bull run, the longest ever. So I don't expect the top to be like this one touch and, and that's it, but rather more of like a topping process that could take up to many, many months, right? And I think we're basically doing that right now. And so at the last video, I talked about how this, just the past week was going to be an indicator because, you know, we just hit all-time ties after the Fed cut 50 basis points. And if we don't have a follow-through, and that's what I was looking for in the markets after such a move, well, then that's a signal. If we did have a follow through, that's also another signal. And now that the week has passed, let's take a look at what happened. Now, in the beginning of last week, the stock market kind of went nowhere for a while, for a few days. It tried to go above and it got, you know, so it wasn't a good sign, right? There was no follow through or interest or pent up demand to keep, keep the all time high going, which was a sign. But what happened later in the week was China then pulled the trigger on the equivalent of the United States 0708 um, stimulus package and bazookas and basically just cut everything and provided flooded the market with liquidity. They even have a program where you can basically buy stocks using their money or their loan to prop up their stock market, which exploded a lot higher. And what that did was it caused explosions in guess what commodities because what does China have a lot of commodities. So Dr. Copper, boom, going up, exploding up higher, iron ore exploding up higher. And you can say this for almost every other commodity. Basically, the commodity sector just literally like exploded higher because of China, you know, flooding the market with liquidity. So what does that mean? That means, guess what? Higher prices coming to the United States. Why? because there's going to be a supply side push on inflation. When input costs to make stuff becomes more expensive, the stuff you make will also become more expensive. There's only so much that the company can, you know, pass on through to the customer without having, you know, their margin squeezed out, right? So the input costs are going up. This is so inflation has supply side push and demand side pull. The Fed can you know, can manage the demand side pull with interest rates and you know making people not like go overboard or you know cool the market down from buying stuff right but when it comes to the input prices of making stuff the fed has absolutely no control right this is completely clueless completely you know just has to watch right and this is what's going on the other thing that happened and is still going on is and you know if you looked at my earlier video about the coming crisis, right, which includes the geopolitical, not just the financial world regime changing along with digital. Um, if you look at that video, I talk about what's happening in the Middle East and 
sure enough, uh, it's been escalating, right? And, you know, this is, you can't just like live like an ostrich and dump your head into the sand and pretend nothing's going on. There is serious stuff going on in the Middle East. I'm not even going to touch Ukraine right now. Just in the Middle East, there are some serious, serious bad things happening, right? And because we don't live in the Middle East, it's kind of like over there and, oh, you know, I'm telling you, this thing is escalating, escalating and escalating. And just this week, the other day, the, the leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, was taken out, dude, right? Along with the entirety of his top chain of command. This is, this is not something that should be taken lightly by individuals like us at home, because this has incoming repercussions to our safety, ultimately. Trust me on this. Now, this has happened, and the reason I'm bringing it up here is because what's going to happen is oil is going to increase because it actually has been decreasing quite a lot, right? But now it's increasing. Well, of course it's going to increase, right? If this thing escalates, that means Iran might get drawn into it, which means, you know, basically Israel is trying to goad the United States to get into a, a regional war with Iran by just going off, right, and just popping off as much as it can. And that will, you know, once Iran is in, then you might have Russia join in, right? Because Russia's... Anyway, the whole point here is if Iran gets into this and it decides to do anything with the Straits of Hormuz, which controls 40% of the entire global flow of oil, that tiny strait in the Middle East that Iran controls, the price of oil is going to just explode. I'm talking like not 100%. I mean, we're talking about 400%, right? And we've seen this before. This is what happened in the 70s, during the oil shock. Speaking of which, and by the way, that's going to, again, make price input go up, which means what's going to happen? Inflation's going to go up. This is what happened in the 70s. Inflation skyrocketed, the Fed raised interest rates, and inflation went down. And the Fed said, yay, we beat it. And then guess what happened? <laughs> it rocketed up even higher, right? Guess what was involved in this rocketing up higher back then? That's right, a crisis in the Middle East. Basically, the OPEC cartel saying, look, we're gonna control the supply of oil. We are tracking this <laughs> incredibly today in a way that is uncanny. And so here we are right now. They just cut interest rates by 50 basis points, saying that they slayed the inflation dragon. Meanwhile, China just exploded liquidity, where commodities now just exploding higher, right when they cut 50 basis points, right? Because it's going to be killed inflation. And the Middle East is exploding into a regional conflict, where guess what? The single greatest input effector, which is oil, has a high chance of going up a lot higher. This is a very, 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 very precarious situation. There's a saying in the economic world called the Anthony Burns, who was the Fed chief, who cut too early and caused this, right? And this is actually what the Fed today is petrified about. Yet they cut 50 basis points when apparently the job market's just fine, GDP is good, stocks are all the time high, Real estate's at a all time high. Everything's going great. Yet they did a 50 basis points, which is a jumbo cut, as if there was some crisis looming. Why? We'll find out soon enough. But keep this in close view because it's nothing's guaranteed in life, right? But this is something, given the geopolitical and macroeconomic conditions of what's going on, something I'm watching very, very carefully. So the last thing I'm going to talk about in this video is what I think is going to happen next week. And actually, I'm actually going to show you what the heck I'm doing in order to, you know, trade around that. Now, I was having this interesting chat with a colleague of mine. He's a very smart individual, doesn't share the same long-term views as I do, but I do value his thought process. And, you know, in that chat, he's like, well, it all boils down to making money. And absolutely, you know, in the Fofty world, like this, what I'm doing here is just purely just to make money. This is just a means to an end, right? So I can build Fofty out and help more people. And sure, let's talk about making money then. 
And so I'll tell you what I'm doing, right? So you can actually see what the heck I'm doing, right? And, you know, there are a lot of people talk about what they think about what's so going to happen in the stock market, this and that, but well, exactly what, well, open up your wallet. Well, I'm going to actually show you what I'm doing, both up and down, because you don't always make money and sometimes you lose money as well, but you get to see it, right? And you can make a judgment for yourself. Now, this is just what I'm doing. I'm not telling you what to do. If you want to do anything with investment related advice, go find a registered investment advisor, yada, yada, yada. It's for entertainment purposes only. But I will show you what I'm doing, right? And it's very simple, dude. So what I did was at the close of the market last Friday, right before it closed, I bought about $80,000 worth of UVXY. Now UVXY is a long volatility exchange trading fund that's levered up, right? So this is a very, very... Um, explosive instrument. <laughs> Let's just put it at that. So you don't want to hold such things uh, over, over, you know, for too long because there's decay and they're extremely um, risky because they're leveraged, which is why, you know, I, I did put more than what I put in, right? But I'm just going to take this amount and show you what I'm doing with this starting amount of around 80K and seeing if I can build it up to hopefully a million dollars, right? In, in the not too distant future. Um, but basically, yeah, I loaded this up at, before the end of Friday session because number one, as I said, the market activity last week, it didn't follow through, which to me was the signal. It was a signal and it is a signal I'm going to use for the next week's activity. Now, how long am I going to stay in this position? Um, you know, I'm not going to like update you every second of what I'm doing. I don't do many trades and I don't do a lot of trades, right? This is, a, look how simple this is. This is buying one ETF on the market and that's it, right? <laughs> but the reason I did that, aside from the price action last week and the signal, was at the end of the day, right? So after the Japanese market had closed, right? This happened. And what is this? That is the yen, right? Becoming super strong. Like, you know, when you see a bar like this, something has happened and something did happen, right? And guess what? Japan has elected a new prime minister who is not dovish at all. This guy, Ichibo, is a huge hawk, right? Which means strong yen and higher interest rates for Japan, which has had the lowest interest rates or negative interest rates for the longest time of all, right? The Fed is like junior compared to what Japan has been doing in terms of printing money. Boom. After the market closed, so this is why you have to look at aftermarket activity. You know, the U.S. market, I look at actually what's happening outside the U.S. to determine what I'm doing in the U.S. Because what's happening in the U.S., doesn't matter anymore. It's not up to the Fed anymore. It's not up to the Fed, right? It's up to what the heck is going on around the world, such as an escalation in the Middle East with oil or China exploding the commodities, you know, inflation gun and exporting inflation or an election in Japan that's driving up the yen to like crazy, you know, levels within, within an hour. Soon after the yen went up, the Japanese Nikkei, which is their stock market, crashed, right? And this happened, again, after the market closed in Japan. Now, we were still open. And that's when I saw this, I was like, that's a signal I'm going to get. The reason is, and I've been telling this to you before, there are fundamental things that I still watch, even though it's really psychology that dictates price action on the market. But the fundamentals do impact our psychology. And so one of the key things I've always said is to look for the Japan, the JPY, the yen carry trade, to re, re emerge again. And, you know, in my previous video. And the reason why is because, as I said back then, things that take decades to set up doesn't get unraveled in just a week. It doesn't really ever work that way. And so, what we just saw was an appetizer back then when we had that huge, like, you know, spike in volatility. Volatility increased by over 100% in one single day uh, when there was that scare of the Japanese yen carry trade unwinding. And what caused that scare was, well, the J Japanese yen became really strong randomly. Why? Because the Japanese 
bank decided to raise interest rates and then they had to quickly pivot and say, no, we're not going to do this when they saw the entire world market collapse around them. So that was the canary in the coal mine. Now we have a situation where it's not just a central bank, but Japan has elected somebody who's a hawk who wants to raise interest rates and save, and I don't blame him, right? The, the, the economy, right? Save the currency. And guess what that's going to do? That's going to increase again a fear of the yen carry trade unwinding once more. And so that is the reason why I entered that position. It is a position that I believe has a good risk reward ratio. And we shall see what happens, right? Again, nothing's guaranteed in life. Um, but as far as an entry point, given what I've seen and the way I look at the economy and geopolitics, within the context of the U.S. stock market, it was a good entry point for me. So let's see what happens. Um, uh, next week is, I think, going to be a, a very telling week. I do expect next week to be a down week. So unlike the last video where I said, just look for the signal, whether up or down, now I'm saying, and I put my money where my mouth is, I think next week it is going to be a down week, right? And we're closely tracking the 0708 topping process which takes many many months before what I think is going to happen which is a lot of slowdown a recession that could turn into a depression and possible global wars which is the whole point of FOFTI you need to be able to reset yourself and your mindset to prepare so you can make the difficult changes that you need to make so that you don't get caught with your pants down when stuff hits the fan see you in the next episode